Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? She said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle with one of them, one of them owed him 10,000 talents, and he was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that they had, and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and he began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. So his slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported all to their Lord what had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, hand him over to the torturers until he would repay back all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother in his heart. That's what we like to call in church the F word. Forgiveness. If you were to look at the national debt counter, <clears throat> you'd read that the United States of America is $21.2 trillion in debt. Now, to give you an idea of how much debt this actually is, if the United States were to pay back a dollar every second for a debt, that would be $86,400. Now, if you multiply that by paying a dollar a second for the next year, that'd come out to roughly or, sorry, $31,536,000 a year. Do you know how many years it would take to pay off $1 trillion in debt at a dollar a second? It would take 31,700 years to pay off $1 trillion in debt. When you multiply 31,700 years by 20, what do you get? You get 634,000 years to pay off the national debt at a dollar a second, every second, for the next 600 and 34,000 years. Honest question, do you think the United States will ever pay off its national debt? You know, there's somebody who actually came close to it once. His name was Andrew Jackson. He actually came close to paying off the national debt. Then we had like the Great Depression and lots of other things, so on and so forth. Good morning, Old Union. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to uh, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to discover yet another parable about what the kingdom of God is indeed like. Jesus describes it as a world where God is king and where people? Thank you so much. It's the range of God's effective rule where what he wants done is most certainly done. And Jesus is going to be approached by Peter this morning. And Peter's going to come to him and he's going to ask him a question. Now, if you look within the context of Matthew 18, you begin to understand a little bit more about the question. But he comes and he says, hey, how many times should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Now, Jesus is going to go into a parable that describes... An insurmountable debt that will never be repaid, and why forgiveness received does not mean forgiveness experienced. Ultimately, what I want you to understand is that people who live in the kingdom of God, they have no problem forgiving any offense made against them because they live from the disposition of forgiven offenses. Let's pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, 
God, as we come before your throne of grace, there's a lot of people in here that uh, are going to want to get up and leave. And Father God, I pray that uh, you keep their butts in their seats. I pray that you would allow them to hear what it is that you have to say this morning. And that you would allow us to be able to forgive deep grudges, deep offenses from our hearts. Father God, if we cannot do this, I pray that you would allow us to experience your great forgiveness that you've given us and the insurmountable debt we've accumulated against you. It's in the strong name of Jesus Christ that we lift these things up and pray and all of God's people said. Amen. Verse 21, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Peter thinks that his answer is sufficient in understanding his rabbi's grasp upon forgiveness. You see, the earlier rabbis taught that if a person sins against you three times, you should forgive them up to three times. But after a fourth time, you should be able to think differently about that person. You should withhold your forgiveness. They've had their chance. So Peter knows this. He's going to double it. And then he's going to add one for good measure, thinking that he understands Jesus' level of forgiveness that he taught to his disciples. Look at what Jesus says. I did not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Jesus is actually saying a whole lot here. And I wish I had just a whole sermon to dedicate to it, but I don't. So I'm going to give you the abridged version. He says, I didn't tell you a specific legalistic number that you can just sit there and check off, that you can check off, that you can check off, that you can check off, you can check off. And then once they've accumulated this number, then, then forgiveness to be withheld. No, I said 70 times seven. Now, if you're going to do the math, you're going to come out to 490 times that Jesus is accumulating to. A question is for you. Do you think that after a person, Jesus is saying that after a person sins against you 491 times, you can withhold what you think about that person, that you can now treat that person differently, that you can withhold your forgiveness? You think that's what Jesus is talking about? Of course not, right? In fact, the math, believe it or not, isn't really even there. If you look at earlier manuscripts, you're going to find just 77, the, word, the number, two sevens next to each other. That's what you're going to find. In Luke's version, in the Greek, it just says the word seven and then the word times making you think that, oh, just seven times and, and you'll be fine. It wouldn't have mattered if Jesus said seven times seven equals 409 times or if he was saying 77 times, which is more accurately to be understood, because Jesus is communicating an unlimited amount of forgiveness to be given. I believe that Jesus is actually alluding to Lamech's scale of retaliation found in Genesis chapter 4, verse 24. As Lamech boasts about his wicked anger and about his great vengeance, he says, if Cain is avenged sevenfold because of the killing of his brother, the first murder in mankind, then Lamech's seventy-sevenfold. Now, ultimately, what he's saying here is he's describing that the vengeance that would be done upon Cain for shedding innocent blood... The same vengeance exists in me, not seven times, but 77 times. Lamech's anger and retaliation is so great that he is going to admit in the Bible, in a song, he is going to admit to killing a man who wounded him and killing a boy who offends him. In the same way that there was no measure to Lamech's retaliation and anger, so too, there's no limit to your forgiveness towards your brother. Contrasting with Lamech's unwillingness to forgive, Jesus answers Peter's question by saying, you should have an unwillingness to be even offended. And when you do that, it makes it easy to forgive. I hope you caught that. That offenses that are easily forgiven are the ones that didn't really cause that great of an offense. Notice how in our story, within its context, if you look at Matthew 18, you're going to notice the context is the reconciliation process found earlier in the chapter. 
This is actually dealing with a brother who does not wish to repent and does not seek out the healing that forgiveness brings. Now here's the cool thing. Reconciliation needs two people. Forgiveness only needs one. And Jesus says that if your brother needs if your brother needs your consent to feel at peace and to be at peace within his heart, then you never keep him from that. You never withhold your forgiveness from anyone for any wrong that they've done to you, ever. Earlier in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, 15, Jesus is going to say, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive you of your transgressions. In the early church, as the Corinthian believers were dragging each other to court, hoping to win the verdict over their brother, Paul complains in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 7, It is already a defeat for you. That you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? Guys, let me tell you something. People get their feelings hurt all the time by Christian brothers and sisters. I can go back over the last eight years and have countless examples for you of each other of you who have hurt each other's feelings. Get over it. We're not even talking about feelings here. We're actually talking about real offenses that incur real liability. Give you an example. If you're a landlord and your Christian tenant, who's a brother in Christ, sues you for three months' rent because you failed to maintain property livable standards, regardless if they are right or wrong, Paul says, isn't it better just to be defrauded? Isn't it better... To just be defrauded than to have a person walk around burning in their heart anger that you could have quenched? Now, I know it sounds like this complete and utter radical idea. But in Jesus' kingdom, we should be willing and able to easily dismiss any offense or wrongdoing, whether repented for or not. Now, some of you all... You're going to look at me, and you're going to sit there and say, how can you say that? Some of you all know my life, and that's what makes it easy for me to say that. But aside from that, I can say that with such great confidence because if any one of you all have experienced the love and the forgiveness and the compassion and the mercy of God in your life, upon your evil heart and your evil deeds and your evil desires, if any one of you all have experienced God's forgiveness in your life, then you can readily give that and make that available to anyone. This parable that we're about to walk through is going to change your entire life. And I strongly believe that if you listen to Jesus' words right now, you are going to leave here today and your life is never ever going to be the same. Are you ready to get into it? Verse 23, for this reason, God's kingdom, the range of his effective rule may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with the slaves. Um, Ever had an internal audit done at work? Just like any good business or church or family, they'll sit down maybe midway through the year and they're going to review the books. Hey, where are we at in the yearly budget? How's everything going? They're going to do those different types of things. So for Jesus describes this scene, sitting down and, and getting an account for everything. Hey, where's all our money going? What are we doing? To a king who wishes to settle accounts with some of his workforce. Verse 24. When he had begun to settle with them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. A talent is a unit of measurement in the ancient world, and it was said to have been assigned a particular weight and it in pounds, and according to Leviticus. But a talent also represented the largest unit of measurement in the ancient world, and it was contextualized with how much a person actually made in their entire lifetime. To give an example, let's say I make $100,000 a year. If I were to make $100,000 a year for every year for the remainder of my life, 
Whatever sum that that would be would be considered in the ancient world a talent. You guys with me so far? If Donald Trump makes $214 million a year, which I don't know if that's true or not, I'm just saying. If he makes $214 million a year, and every year he would make $214 million, at the end of his lifetime, everything that he recruited would be called talent. Are you guys with me so far? This man, this servant, manages to steal 10,000 lifetimes of debt. He steals 10,000 lifetimes of goods and coin. Now, if we go back and we look at our debt counter, knowing that it would take 630,000 years at a dollar every second, do you really think that this man is going to pay back 10,000 lifetimes of goods and coin? Verse 25, but since he did not have the means to repay, it's not like he can just go to his bank and be like, ah, I'm going to make a withdrawal. His Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and all of his children, however many children that would have been, and all that he had in repayment to be made. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that the king is being unreasonable? In the ancient world, the burden of debt was handed down from family member to family member until the debt was satisfied. Do you really think the king is being unfair or unreasonable? Let me ask you a question. Do you think the king is just in his actions? Absolutely. Verse 26. So the slave fell on the ground. And he prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me. Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Now, this is what gets me. This man comes to him in humility, and he utters, I will pay you back all if you just give me the time, and if you're just patient with me. He knows he can't pay this back. Like, the king knows he can't pay this back. And on top of this, do you really think a wise king is going to look at this guy and come to the conclusion that this man accidentally lost 10,000 lifetimes of debt? Oh, sir, I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, I hit the wrong button. There's no button. This is deliberate transgression over and over and over again for years and years against this king. This man is a con artist. He's not mournful because of the bad he's done. He's sorry because he got caught. The king knows this. He knows the con man's character. But still the king acts out of forgiveness and he pardons his debt. What kind of king does that. Let me suggest to you two reasons why I think the king does this. First reason is the king knows that this act of forgiveness may just pierce the heart of this con man. He knows, and in fact he hopes for it, because you're going to see that later in the text, that if I can just act in forgiveness towards this man, maybe he might see the light. You're going to see how he expects that. Second reason the king forgives is that the king must satisfy his need to be merciful. He must satisfy his character to be merciful. He knows that there's no way that this debt could ever be paid. And the king would rather forgive the debt than to let this man rot away for all of eternity in order for his mercy to be satisfied. That's our king. And that's what the kingdom of God is like. That's who God is. He needs his mercy, his character satisfied. Look at verse 27 and 28. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But the slave went out and he found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, which is a hundred days wages if you're a skilled laborer. And he seized him, and he began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. This man wants justice. This man 
wants what's right. He wants what's fair. He wants what's owed to him. Verse 29. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. The same exact words that had such weight that would move the heart of the king not moments before have zero effect upon his hardened heart because this man, this man doesn't want mercy or grace to rule his life. He wants what's right. He wants justice. He just doesn't realize that grace has set him free. And now you're going to see now how the only thing you can give another person is that which you already have or have received. Look at verse 30. But the wicked slave, he was unwilling and went and threw his slave into prison until he should pay back all that was owed. This con man, this, uh, this matchstick man, he received forgiveness in full. Would you agree with that? So why could he not share forgiveness with someone else? Because he hadn't yet experienced it. When my wife and I were discussing this parable, my wife said that the man hadn't accepted the gift, so therefore he could not give it. This man didn't understand the complete hopelessness of his situation. He didn't understand how wrong he was. He had no concept of the weight of his sin debt. And I'm going to suggest to you, in fact, that the reason that this man doesn't share forgiveness is because it's not there in his heart. He's unwilling to share in forgiveness. He's, he's very willing to share in his anger, in his frustration. He's willing to share his violence in his condemnation, in his outrage. But because he's never experienced true forgiveness in his heart, he can't share what isn't there. And in part to Peter, this becomes the explanation. In your own life, if you've experienced God's goodness and love and grace, it should be made available to others. In some ways, I believe that this man really wasn't convinced that he was a sinner. He wasn't convinced that he needed forgiveness because when you look, he, in his hopeless circumstance, he either A, thought he could work his way completely out of the debt, or B, he was a liar and had no intention of changing. Either way, it doesn't really matter because his actions reveal his words. His actions are going to reveal his heart. Look at verse 31 through 33. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to all their Lord what had happened. And then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy upon you? The mercy was supposed to move the man. It was supposed to grip the man. It was supposed to change the man, but it didn't. It had no effect upon his hardened heart. You can't accept God's pardon for all the wrong that you've done and then turn around and angrily demand justice for somebody who's wronged you. Have you ever met a Christian that holds grudges? I actually know of a number of you all here that have personally told me that you've hold and held and constantly hold another person in contempt for something that they've done for you. I know a lot of you guys. Hey, have you ever met a Christian that speaks negatively about a person in their life that's wronged them? I know about five of you all in here that are sitting in this room right now that have told me that exact same thing. Hey, have you ever met a Christian who simply said, I just can't forgive that. I won't forgive that. Who can forgive that? I know about three of you all in there that have said those exact same words to me. 
And let me tell you something. These types of people, they have no problem for receiving a provision of mercy from themselves, but are, they're very quite discontent with sharing with other people that actually need it. Especially people that have asked for forgiveness. Let me tell you something. You can't hold humility in your hand and hold arrogance in the other. You can't hold on to forgiveness and simultaneously hold on to unforgiveness. God's going to make you choose. Now, I want you to imagine a scene that takes place in heaven. We're all up there, clouds, streets of gold, whatever you decide. And God's letting people enter in and begin to explore this vast new world that he's created for us all. And in it, there's somebody who thinks that they can demand that wrongs be made right in heaven? Are you kidding me? You've just been forgiven of everything that has ever happened to you, that you've, every offense that you've made towards your brother and towards God simultaneously. And then you're going to go around in heaven, find people who owe you, find people who've wronged you, and then claim and say that you want justice to be done? Are you kidding me? You know what you're doing. You're actually placing yourself back under the law. What do you want? I want justice. I want things to be made right. I want things to be made fair. Do you want God's mercy and grace? Yes. Like, it doesn't work like that. Look at verses 34 and 35. And his Lord moved with anger, handed them over to, be the, to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same for you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Paul writes, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Make no mistake about forgiveness. If a brother or sister comes to you needing to clear their conscience and you rob them of the healing because of your bitterness or because of your unwillingness to forgive, you're saying that you want justice, that you want fairness, and you don't want grace. And I honestly believe that God will honor that request. And if you want justice, if you want fairness, God will most certainly give that to you in hell. Because that's what's right. That's what you deserve. That's what you've got coming to you. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Now this parable is a warning that God cannot forgive us if we do not have a repentative heart. If we don't have a heart of repentance, if we don't have a humble heart, we will not experience God's forgiveness to bestow upon others. Now I'm going to take some time here, and I decided to add it to my sermon, so it's going off the cuff. I, I know that some of you all were raised in the church, and I know that some of you all, for the most part, have had a pretty clean record in your life. And some of you all may hold yourself to a standard of elitism because you honestly believe that you've not really done a lot of bad things in your life. Let me put something in perspective for you. Remember that national debt counter? Remember the man who owed 10,000 lifetimes of debt? Every single offense that you have made against your brother your sister, every single offense that you've made against God, every careless word that has come out of your mouth, every time that you've caused pain, every time that you've lied, that you've stolen something that wasn't yours, every time that you committed adultery in your heart, 
every time that you've cheated, defrauded, every single time where you've acted selfishly and not selflessly, every single time, every one sin incurs an eternity of debt that you will never repay, ever. So how on earth can you accept this pardon from God for everything you've ever done that cost 10,000 lifetimes of eternity if you can't forgive an offense that somebody has made against you here on earth? To wrap up our parable time, we got some truths that God has given us. And let me ask you a simple question. Is there evidence of you forgiving and having an outpouring of forgiveness on those who have wronged you? Have you made any attempts necessary, maybe even to seek forgiveness from another person? Which means that you'd have to admit that you were wrong and then have something be done about it. Well, Barrett, what, um, what happens uh, when I make the attempts but the other person refuses to, um, to allow peace to come between us? Guys, it takes one person to forgive it takes two people to be reconciled. Reconciliation is contingent because sometimes it's made unavailable. A person passes away and they never sought out your forgiveness. You must forgive them from your heart absent of their request because it only takes one person to forgive and to relinquish the hurt and the pain the offender has caused. It only takes one person to forgive, to allow the healing to come into your life. When you humble yourself before God, and you truly believe that you aren't deserving of God's grace and his mercy, you can see any offense done to you in this lifetime as trivial when stacked up against the 10,000 lifetimes of eternity of debt that you've inquired and sinned against God. Is there someone in here that you need to write a letter to? Is there someone in here that you need to email or call them on the phone? Is there someone you need to run to and meet with right now to hold, to forgive, to plead with? My hope is, is that you would do that. My hope is, is that you would not succumb to the devil's lies, thinking that you can hold on and hold your forgiveness and make that person feel exactly what you would feel. That's the law of retaliation. That's the law of Moses. That's an eye for an eye. And whatever you want, whether mercy or justice, I promise you that God will give you just that. Let's go before God in prayer. Bear we come up. Most gracious Father in heaven. There are a lot of hearts right now that are hurting. I've stirred up some feelings because of thoughts that another person has had about another. And Holy Father, whether they are brother or whether they are heathen, we pray that that forgiveness can come about. We pray that people would have a humble heart to seek forgiveness for wrongs that they have done. We pray, O oh Father in heaven, that you would give us the strength to be able to relinquish all that pain and that hurt over so that we can live appropriately in your kingdom. 
God, we know that love in your kingdom keeps no record of wrongs. That it is not spiteful. And Father, we just pray that we can love people from that disposition. That we, like the Apostle Paul, can turn away from persecution and anger and hatred of the church and turn towards it. Father God, allow forgiveness to be evident. Allow healing to occur so that people know in their heart of hearts that they have truly forgiven another person that has grieved them. Blessed Father, I pray over my congregation and I ask a desperate cry that you would allow relationships to be mended for reconciliation to be made possible under the banner of Christ. But if it cannot, if it does not, holy and blessed Father, allow at least forgiveness to occur. God, it is a lot of burden to carry around past offenses, to carry around past hurts. It affects everything that we do. We know this. God, allow us to get rid and wash out all the bitterness and all the hate and all the anger, all the contempt and indifference, and be able to put on Christ his love, his mercy, and his compassion. It's in the strong name of the resurrected Lord we lift these things up and pray, and all of God's people said. Amen. You should be standing and join us as we enter into a time.